Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. As always, just giving a moment for all the attendees to join in. We have a really great presentation today, and we're really excited about that. Dr. Barry will be hosting it. And uh, before that, we do have, as we mentioned, occasionally we'll have COVID updates uh, as there are new things to update on. Uh, Dr. Pinsky, thanks as always for being with us, I can say now for years. Uh, and I'll turn it to you to get some updates. Hey, thank you, Errol. Let me share my screen. So a quick update on the SARS-CoV-2. Um, here's our testing numbers. Uh, our seven-day positivity rate you can see up here is just over 4%. Now that's creeping up. It's hard to see on this graph, but it's up about 1%. So we are seeing additional uh, SARS-CoV-2 positives um, in our patient population. Um, just a word about the variants. So at the moment, most of our cases are uh, BA2. Uh, there are a couple new lineages that are starting to circulate. Uh, they get some numbers, BA4 and BA5. These are basically BA2 with uh, some additional mutations in spike, and they're differentiated by uh, other mutations in different parts of the genome. There's also some recombinant lineages that have official names now. Uh, XD, this is the so-called Delta Cron. I prefer Amelta, but this is a... Uh, uh, recombinant uh, um, between Delta and uh, Omicron. And then there's XE, uh, which is a uh, recombinant between two of the Omicron lineages. Um, XD is very uncommon. XE is increasing in uh, the UK. So we'll keep an eye out for that. We have not seen these other uh, lineages or recombinants in our patient population uh, so far. And then you can just see here from WHO, the transition from BA1, BA1.1 to BA2, uh, which is now the predominant strain, again, in our population and uh, globally. And then just one more word um, about other respiratory viruses. We are seeing an increase in uh, influenza A. You can see that here in um, adults in this teal color here over the last several weeks. So uh, some of the respiratory illness that we are seeing is not SARS-CoV-2, but instead influenza. So thank you for the time to present and I'll hand it back over to Errol. Thanks so much, Dr. Pinsky, as always for being with us and we'll continue to give updates uh, throughout the year as uh, relevant for COVID-19 again. Thank you, Dr. Pinsky. Before I turn it over, uh, just if we could share the slides for next week's grand presenter, uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Barry, just want to mention next week, uh, we're continuing to be on Zoom only except for uh, the first medical grand rounds of the month. So the next one in person with Zoom as well will be on May 4th. Uh, next week, we have uh, Dr. Hader Warach. He's a heart failure uh, the physician at the Women and Br Brigham and Women's uh, Hospital. He actually has published a, a number of books, uh, one on the history and science in heart failure at, back a few years ago. And he has a new book coming out. We actually have a number of them ordered for all our house staff, as well as um, other faculty who may want uh, at the same time we'll be giving out when he comes and gives grand rounds uh, virtually next week. And then we have some other great grand rounds coming up in the weeks after as well. Um, with that being said now, I wanna turn it over to Dr. Barry. Dr. Barry, thanks uh, as always. You've led multiple grand rounds yourself. You've hosted multiple grand rounds, helped us really recruit a number of wonderful presenters just like today. Thanks so much for everything you've done to help support grand rounds and everything else. I'll turn it over to you now. My pleasure, Eric. Um, it's a pleasure um, for me to um, be with you today to introduce our two speakers, Dr. Sherry Weiser and Dr. Ariane Tehrani. They're co-directors and co-founders of the University of California Center for Climate Health and Equity. They were invited to speak with us today about the climate crisis and health, what we know and how we can take action. I don't think there can be a more important or timely topic as we find ourselves in a code red, really code red moment for the fate of our climate and health. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just released its report on climate change mitigation this month and made clear that if we don't take strong and immediate action, the consequences of human health will be dire. Many of us um, have seen the impacts in our own California practices of extreme heat, toxic smoke from wildfires, increased pollen blooms, and geographic moving infectious diseases. Not only is the healthcare industry serving on the front lines of climate change, it also has an important role to play in curbing its own carbon emissions. 
I hope this presentation can inspire us as physicians to take action. My, it's my pleasure to introduce these two extraordinary women working in the field. Dr. Ariane Teherani is a professor of medicine and education scientist in the Center for Faculty Educators at UCSF. She is also the co-founder and director of the new Center for Climate Health and Equity, along with Dr. Weiser. Ariane's leadership is extensive, including launching and co-leading the UCS Equity and Justice in an Education Initiative, leading the climate change and health course for medical students and pharmacy students, and leading the University of California wide climate and health education faculty development initiative. And not but least, she founded the, she's found, founded the UCSF Academic Senate Committee on Sustainability. She currently serves on the Global Climate Leadership Council faculty engagement team and chairs the UC Sustainability and Diversity Justice and Equity Advisory Council. Dr. Sherry Weiser, also co-founder and director of this new Center for Climate Health and Equity at UCSF, is a professor of medicine and internist in the Division of HIV, Infectious Disease, and Global Medicine there. Her research over the past 20 years focuses on the impact of food insecurity, extreme weather events, and other social and structural factors on treatment outcomes for HIV and chronic diseases both domestically and internationally. She evaluates sustainable food insecurity and livelihood interventions as, as a way to improve health. Sherry is a prolific researcher with over 200 publications in these areas, and she's quite young, and co, I think, and co-leads a training program in Kenya called Sustainable Development for Health, HIV Health, with a goal to train the next generation of Kenyan leaders on how to develop climate adaptive and sustainable food security. She has also co-led the University of California-wide Climate and Health Education Faculty Development Initiative, which has trained faculty members across all the UC schools, UC health science schools to integrate climate and health into their ongoing courses. Lastly, I'd like to take just a moment to let you know about two global health events that you might want to join. Um, that our center is hosting one tomorrow on a, with a virtual global health conversation with Dr. Patty Garcia, the a former Minister of Health of Peru. And on Monday, April 18th, we'll host the eighth annual global health research convening, which you're all invited to join at Ariaga Alumni Center, fe featuring the global health researchers across Stanford's campus. So now we're delighted to have these remarkable leaders in climate and global health with us today. Dr. Drs. Tehrani and Weiser, take it away. You see the slides? Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you everyone. And thank you for that. Um, very nice introduction, Michelle, um, and for having us here today to talk about this timely topic. Climate change poses an unparalleled threat to human health and well being, as Michelle so nicely articulated, and we need to take urgent action to face this existential threat. Next slide. Um, with that in mind, uh, today, what we uh, we'll begin with is an overview of the human health impacts of the climate crisis, including how climate change helps drive significant health disparities. Uh, we will then do a deeper dive to explore pathways through which climate change leads to worse health outcomes. And finally, we will highlight promising solutions and opportunities for action within the health sector with a spotlight on some exciting initiatives within the new University of California White Center for Climate Health and Equity. Next slide. Um, so on a school holiday back into October of 2019, my family was excited to drive to Los Angeles for a visit. For those of you who are familiar with the drive on the five freeway, there is this high summit point at which the view of Los Angeles becomes visible and always indicates the end of a long drive between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And when we arrived at the top of the summit, we saw an orange glow in the distance. What we didn't realize was that we were driving toward a fire. What was the Silmar fire that year, which would soon be on both sides of the freeway, 
black and burning, flames frying, flying at the car, visibility through the smoke was almost none. So we, along with all the other cars you see in this picture, were barely moving. There was a long time in which we were sure we would be engulfed along with the other cars in the fire. What we didn't realize as we were so focused on getting through the fire was that our 13 year old was crying hysterically thinking she was not going to make it out alive. We did make it through and the fire was eventually put out, but uh, my child could not sleep that night or the nights that ensued. My child is now 16 and between June and November, she continues to have anxiety when there is a heat wave announcement like the one that we just had last week. And fe the fear continues to impact her and many other young people around the world where 152 of 196 countries saw an increase in annual daily population exposure to wildfires. Next slide. In their 2019 countdown, um, The Lancet notes, and I quote, the life of every child born today will be profoundly affected by climate change. Without accelerated intervention, this new era will come to define the health of people at every stage of their lives. I don't think I need to tell this audience how dire the situation is. Projections of widespread impacts of climate change are now made in terms of mere decades. We are expecting that there will be at least 200 million migrants by the year 2050. This means that one out of every 45 people in the world will have been displaced by climate change. Climate change is causing an increase in global hunger. It is estimated that one out of nine people in the world are hungry and that climate change will increase this number by 20 to 50% by mid-century. As much as one third of the world's population, about 3 billion people will be living in dangerous extreme heat by 2070. And finally, it's estimated that climate change will reduce global economic output by 11 to 14% by mid-century, amounting to the loss of as much as $23 trillion. The planetary health model that we um, have projected here for you asserts that the changes that result from our human action, what we call anthropogenic change, has outstripped the resources available from the only habitable planet that we know. So human activities are driving fundamental change at a scale that hasn't existed in the history of our species. Dr. Sam Myers of the Planetary Health Alliance created this useful schematic that you see here, showing how human disruption of our planet's natural systems shapes our health. Human activities, including consumption patterns, are underlying drivers of fundamental economic change, uh, are fundamental ecological changes. The ecological changes or drivers include climate change and biodiversity loss, and each of these interacts with the others in complex ways to amplify and worsen their impacts. These serve as proximate causes that alter the quality of the air we breathe, the water we have access to, the food we produce, and rapidly changing environmental conditions also shape our exposures to outcomes such as infectious disease and natural hazards. And mediating factors such as governance and wealth shape how populations experience the effect of disrupted natural systems. And finally, these changes ultimately affect every dimension of our health and well being. And we're going to briefly take a deeper dive into this model, starting with the ecological drivers. The scale of our ecological footprint is enormous. Our consumption of fossil fuels has increased by approximately 550% since 1950. We um, are using nearly half of our accessible fresh water and about half of the planet's livable surface to grow our food. We have dammed 60% of the world's rivers and cleared nearly half of the temperate and tropical rainforest. And species extin extinction rates are at a thousand times higher than baseline rates. And these rapidly changing ecological drivers in turn impact the proximate causes that we reviewed in the planetary health schematic to influence every dimension of human health and well being from malnutrition and infectious disease to chronic disease, mental health, injuries, and premature death. 
We will delve into some of these impacts that we're seeing and we'll be seeing more of over the coming years. For a specific example relevant here to California is extreme heat that's responsible for more deaths in the US than all other weather related dis uh, disasters combined. The harmful health effects of heat are well documented ranging from mild discomfort to heat stress and heat stroke um, to worsen to pre-existing chronic disease and mental health conditions from 2000 to 2018 heat wave exposure among the elderly had increased by approximately 57%. And globally increasing average temperatures means that the average temperature of the record hot weather will become hotter and hotter over time. No understanding of the climate and health crisis would be complete without acknowledging how it drives significant health disparities. Most vulnerable regions and populations throughout the world are most at risk for climate exposures and impacts, including areas with already high levels of food insecurity and poverty, as well as large disease burdens. Vulnerable communities around the world are most susceptible to climate risks, including migrants, people of color, and the elderly and children. The bottom line is that climate change intersects with structural injustices to exacerbate existing disparities, leading those who contribute the least to greenhouse gas emissions to suffer first and worst from its harmful effects. And this is often referred to as the climate gap. The two maps shown here really display how glaring this climate gap can be. So on the bottom left, we see that the countries with the highest per capita CO2 or carbon dioxide emissions, i.e. the greatest consumers, such as the US and Canada, Australia and Russia also have the lowest mortality linked to climate change that you see shown in the top right map. So meanwhile, areas with the lowest per capita emissions such as South America and Africa suffer some of the highest climate related mortality rates. We see the climate gap in the context of extreme heat. For example, in Los Angeles, African-Americans are twice as likely to die from heat waves compared to other residents. Agricultural workers are also 35 times more likely to die due to occupational heat exposure. In a study of over 100 American cities, formerly redlined neighborhoods are now five degrees hotter on average during the summer. These neighborhoods have less access to air conditioning and fewer trees and more paved surfaces that trap and radiate heat. This is what we call um, the um, heat island effect. Uh, next, um, substantial disparities also exist in wildfire impacts. While non-Hispanic white communities tend to have more exposure to ambient particulate matter from wildfire smoke, uh, BIPOC and low wealth communities experience more individual exposure via higher infiltration of smoke pollutants into their homes. So given that people of color already experience disproportionately more air pollution as a result of environmental racism, these wildfire smoke effects have the potential to exacerbate already existing health disparities within these communities. The climate gap also emerges in extreme weather events like hurricanes and flooding. The key US extreme weather events you see represented here have all included disparities in injury, fatality rates, and long-term economic impacts associated with displacement and livelihood disruption. And now I'm going to turn to Sherry, who will give us a deeper dive into the pathways through which climate change affects health outcomes, and then begin our discussion on solutions. Thank you, Ariane, and thank you so much, Michelle, for uh, the kind introduction, and, and we're so happy to be here today. So here is a conceptual framework that my team and I developed initially to understand the bi-directional links between climate change and HIV, but we've adapted it here more generally to look at pathways towards worse health outcomes. And we've been testing this framework empirically in studies and in particular looking at infectious disease outcomes. So starting at the top of the figure is global environmental change. And I'm sorry, the, something, sorry. So is a global environmental change, which includes the ecologic drivers from the planetary health model that Ariane just reviewed, so rising greenhouse gases and temperatures, flooding and heat waves, among other things. And these ecologic drivers lead to poor health outcomes both directly, such as by a heat-related illness and death, and also trauma and injury from extreme weather events, 
and also indirectly through the five mechanisms listed here, which are water and food insecurity, migration and displacement, conflict and violence, and vector and host migration. And these five mechanisms in turn can increase the incidence and severity of both infectious and chronic diseases, contribute to poor mental health, and even premature death. These pathways are also interrelated to one another. So for instance, we know that food and water insecurity contributes to migration and displacement and can also result in gender-based violence. At the bottom of the figure, you can see that increased morbidity and mortality then contribute to decreases in household resources and decreased labor availability, which then feeds back to cause further depletion of natural resources through things like deforestation, land degradation and overfishing, and then perpetuating this vicious cycle towards worse ecologic harm. And I will be using this framework to walk through some of the research. So starting with the water insecurity pathway, there is substantial evidence that climate change is worsening water insecurity worldwide, and that water insecurity is a key driver of poor health outcomes. So currently, one in three people in the world lack access to safe drinking water, and over half of the world's population doesn't have access to safe sanitation. And climate change, unfortunately, is exacerbating this problem. So it's estimated that by 2025, half of the world's population will be living in water-stressed areas. So in this map, you can see the deeper blue spots represent regions with rapidly increasing amounts of water, and the red spots are regions with rapidly decreasing amounts of water. And both of these contribute to water insecurity and pose major threats to human health. So just as an example, we know that drought can lead to malnutrition and dehydration, which can then impair our immune responses, and increasing one's susceptibility to infections. Flooding can increase the spread of waterborne illnesses, such as cholera, and also cause direct injury and death. And we've also, in our research, shown that water insecurity is associated with HIV viral non-suppression, with having an AIDS-defining illness, low health-related quality of life, and depression. So as an example, for instance, of how drought can affect infectious diseases, <clears throat> using Uganda National Panel Survey data, our team found that as precipitation increased, self-reported diarrhea, fever, and uh, cough in uh, children decreased, but you could see that the relationship actually leveled off and started to increase again in the highest levels of rainfall. As another example of health impacts from too much or too little precipitation, studies consistently show that uh, those living in drought conditions have a higher prevalence of HIV. So for example, one study that used data from 19 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa found that each year of experiencing drought led to an 11% increase in HIV AIDS prevalence. And then looking at the converse and using data from 23 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, we found that each year of experiencing extreme precipitation was associated with a 25% higher likelihood of HIV among women. In, in a qualitative study among HIV infected individuals in Kenya led by Tammy Nicastro on our team, participants really described how wet living conditions and also contaminated water from floods contributed for them to increased opportunistic inf infections, more diarrhea outbreaks, and increased incidence of malaria. And all of these contributed to worse HIV health for them. And here's a quote, even though we rarely face chronic diseases, malaria and flu were common during this recent rainy season. Malaria is more common now due to stagnant pools of water that breed mosquitoes during rains. And in the same study, participants also reported that infrastructure challenges related to storms and flooding really undermined their ability to access healthcare. And this, of course, then undermined their care of their chronic diseases, of other infections, and of their HIV. And here's a quote from a 40-year-old man. When it rains, reaching such a place is a challenge since the roads become muddy and impassable. Reaching Minyanya Clinic is a hustle because the roads are in deplorable condition. The fare is hiked by motorcycle operators. It is very difficult to find any means of transport. <clears throat> so as a final example of how drought can impact health, we also use demographic and health survey data among approximately 130,000 children um, to look at the association between drought in the previous year and vaccination coverage um, in 22 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
And we found that drought was associated with lower odds of completion of four childhood vaccinations. So BCG, DPT, polio, and measles vaccine. So now moving to food insecurity, um, as Ariane pointed out, you know, one in nine people are hungry and nearly one in three people in the world are food insecure. And climate change is certainly exacerbating this problem. So the regions of the world that already have the highest prevalence of hunger, so Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia and Latin America are also those most vulnerable to climate threats, as you can see by the red and orange colors that represent both high hunger and climate vulnerability. Um, climate change negatively impacts all dimensions of food insecurity. So it affects food availability since drought, high temperatures and heavy rains, we know could contribute to crop loss, animal death and migration of fish. We see reduced food access through the economic impacts of climate change, such as income loss and unemployment. There's reduced food utilization or the ability to consume a nutritious diet through worsened diet quality and also food and water contamination. And finally, you can find the stability of the entire food system being compromised through market volatility and increased food prices, as well as political instability and conflict. And then food insecurity in turn is a well-documented driver of a wide range of poor health outcomes. So for example, we and others have shown that food insecurity is associated with worse HIV outcomes along the entire cascade of care from disease acquisition to higher viral loads to higher HIV related morbidity and mortality. Food insecurity is also associated with other sexually transmitted infections and with higher um, mortality from Ebola virus. Uh, we and others have also shown that food insecurity is associated with chronic diseases, such as hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, coronary artery disease, and also with neurologic and mental health problems like cognitive decline, you know, anxiety and depression. So now turning specifically to impacts on nutrition, there's actually been a lot of new important research from the Planetary Health Alliance looking at climate change's impacts on micronutrient deficiencies and associated chronic disease burdens. And elevated carbon dioxide levels have actually been found to contribute to a three to 17% decline in the amount of protein, zinc, and iron in important crops like wheat and rice. And the figure on the bottom shows the risk of deficient intake of these three nutrients under the atmospheric CO2 levels predicted for the year 2050. And you can see that the red and orange colors show the highest risk areas. Climate change is also driving a rapid decline in pollinators around the world. And we know that a large proportion of our dietary nutrients globally comes from pollinated crops like fruits, vegetables, and nuts. And finally, over 1 billion people in the world rely on fish catch in their diet, but fish uh, catch has unfortunately been falling since 1996. And this is in part related to climate change. And then this puts people at further risk for uh, deficiencies, so specifically zinc, iron, and vitamin A deficiencies. As another example of how climate change is affecting nutrition in a meta-analysis, our team found that drought conditions were associated with 46% higher odds of both wasting and underweight prevalence. And in a prediction model, we estimated that climate change is gonna increase the prevalence of malnutrition by greater than 50% by the year 2050. So the quotes on the right-hand side are from the same qualitative study I reviewed earlier. And participants talked about how loss of crops, animals, and income from drought or flooding worsened food insecurity and diet quality, and also contributed to weight loss and stunting in their children. And I'll, I'll just read the top quote here. Weather changes affects yields on my farm. Too much rain or drought interferes with the growth of plants and lowers the quality of yields. This interferes with our children's growth since they are forced to eat food that are difficult to chew. And these climate driven changes in our diet can then alter our gut microbiome and contribute to altered immune responses and inflammation. So for instance, research shows that dietary impacts on our gut microbiome can decrease nutrient absorption and also increase the risk of certain diseases such as infectious, autoimmune and cardiometabolic diseases and even mental health and neuropsychiatric problems due to an activated immune system. And food insecurity itself can also impact inflammation. For example, in a national cohort study among women living with HIV in the US, 
we found that food insecurity was associated with higher levels of inflammatory markers, so IL-6 and TNF-R1 in adjusted analyses. And importantly, we saw significant effects even among people who were both virally suppressed and had high CD4 cell counts, suggesting that viral control did not explain our associations. And we hypothesized that this inflammation may be on the causal pathway from food insecurity to higher HIV morbidity and mortality. So moving now to the migration pathway, climate change is anticipated to drive one of the largest migrations in human history with many negative health consequences. So climate change can influence migration directly, such as through forced displacements from sea level rise, floods, or hurricanes, and also indirectly by really amplifying those socioeconomic and political drivers of migration. <clears throat> so for example, crop failures from drought can disrupt livelihoods and cause food insecurity, which then puts increased pressure on affected populations to migrate. So as you can see in the figure at the bottom, mobility patterns can include migrating away from climate affected areas, such as from coastal areas inland and from rural to urban areas. And people may also migrate into areas of climate risk, particularly if they're already living in a region that's highly susceptible to climate change. And finally, it's actually the immobile populations that may fare the worst in, in terms of their climate health risks due to their inability to migrate. And there are significant health consequences of forced migration from climate change. So migrants often have enlarged sexual networks and higher exposure to gender-based violence, which then could increase their risk of acquiring STDs. Infectious disease outbreaks we know are common in crowded uh, settlements and refugee camps. Disruptions in livelihoods and also in social networks can put people at risk for malnutrition and poor mental health. For migrants who move from rural to urban areas, there is increased risk of chronic disease due to lifestyle and diet changes, and also disruptions in healthcare access. But I should briefly point out the converse, since for some people, of course, mobility could provide a path to health improvement by offering safety from violence, a reduction in food and water insecurity, and access to better healthcare. And in our work, we found that there may be gender differences in climate-related migration. So in a recent analysis using a DHS data from 23 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, in adjusted analyses, we found that women have higher odds of migration in both conditions of drought and excessive rains, while we did not see any significant associations for men. And this has important public health implications since we know that female migrants face unique health challenges, including exposure to more gender-based violence. So on the right-hand side is a quote from that qualitative study I went over earlier. And you can see that floods were viewed as a huge contributor to migration due to destroyed crops, homes, and infrastructure. Floods have increased because you find when it rained less, places like Modi were so affected to an extent that those who live there were forced to relocate to other places. There were some homes that were destroyed completely. Looking now at the violence pathway between climate change and poor health, Studies have linked climate change to different types of violence, including armed conflict, and experts estimate that 3 to 20% of the conflict risk over the past century is really influenced by climate variability or change. So what about impacts of climate change on intimate partner violence, which is a key pathway towards worse health? So we recently evaluated whether drought was associated with intimate partner violence using a demographic and health survey data in 19 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And among around 84,000 women, we found that those living in severe drought had higher odds of reporting that they had a controlling partner, physical violence and sexual violence. And women living in mild and moderate drought conditions had similar outcomes, though results were slightly attenuated. Uh, consistent with the dose response effect. And in a recent systematic review, the authors found that heat waves, hurricanes, and tsunamis were also associated with an increased risk uh, of violence against women and girls. So just as an example, intimate partner violence was two times more likely among women in India affected by tsunamis and five to eight times more likely among American women affected by Hurricane Katrina. Finally, uh, climate change we know altered the breeding patterns and geographic distribution of disease vectors like mosquitoes and ticks, as well as animal reservoirs of infectious diseases. 
So mosquitoes kill 1 million people a year um, from diseases such as malaria and West Nile virus and really are the world's deadliest creature. And since mosquito species are very sensitive to climate and weather changes, uh, changing climate conditions are really uh, shifting their geographic range. And these maps show the current worldwide distribution of the eight, uh, 80s Egypti mosquito that carries Zika virus and dengue fever, and also how this distribution will change um, by the year 2080 under the current uh, emission levels. And as you can see, mosquitoes are projected to move away from some areas and into entirely new areas, but these are areas that don't have immunity or existing public health infrastructure, which will contribute to higher morbidity and mortality. So an estimated 75% of emerging infectious diseases in human are zoonotic, and these are influenced by climate change. Changing climate conditions like rising temperatures and precipitation shifts, combined with human actions like deforestation and urbanization, can shift the geographic range and population density of animal reservoirs and bring them into closer contact with both humans and their livestock, which then creates, uh, unfortunately, the perfect opportunity for viral spillover. And these conditions can also increase pathogen transmission by causing heightened physiologic stress in animal hosts, which thereby reduces their immune response leading to higher pathogen loads. And it is projected that climate change is gonna increase the risk of global pandemics for this foreseeable future. So now that um, we've gotten you all depressed, uh, let me turn to the more hopeful part and talk about solutions, because I think there's a lot we can in fact do to try to tackle how climate change is affecting human health and well-being. So according to the Lancet Commission on Health and Climate Change, acting on climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. And this is because we know that climate solutions have critical health co-benefits. So for example, if we are to uh, decrease fossil fuel emissions by driving less, we're also gonna decrease the 7 million deaths a year attributable to air pollution and the 5 million deaths linked to physical inactivity. And the health sector has a critical role to play here. So in the past year, we've certainly seen a huge increase in the healthcare sector's action on climate, but we need to do much more than what we are doing. So recently, the Department of Health and Human Services put forward eight critical roles of the health sector towards working uh, in climate change solutions. And to name just a few, these include advancing knowledge on climate health and equity links, building health-based climate adaptation and resilience, advancing health equity and climate justice, and building a climate health-ready workforce. So while we won't have time to cover solutions in all of these areas, I'm gonna review some solutions that have health and environmental co-benefits and that target some of the pathways from the conceptual framework that I reviewed. And then I'm gonna to turn to Ariane, who will review other types of solutions such as climate and health education and key policies. And equity really needs to be a critical thread throughout all of this work. So for approximately 10 years, I've been working with my colleagues, Craig Cohen and Elizabeth Bakusi, on an intervention in Western Kenya, which we call Shamba Maisha, which means farming for life in Kiswahili. And this is really an intervention that is responsive to climate related drought, food insecurity and water insecurity. So the intervention includes a loan to purchase a human powered water pump that then enables uh, participants to irrigate their land during the progressively longer dry seasons and also training in sustainable farming practices and financial management. And as an environmental benefit, farmers are practicing regenerative agriculture, so helping to deplete the soil of essentially depleted nutrients. And in our pilot study, we found improvements along many of the proposed pathways, including food security, diet quality, mental health, empowerment, and even reductions in violence, as you can see in the quote on the right. And in terms of HIV clinical indicators, people in the intervention group had an increase in their CD4 cell count by 165 cells compared to controls and also had 7.6 times the odds of being virally suppressed. Community gardening is another environmentally sustainable model that has been looked at as a strategy to address food insecurity in urban areas. And my colleague Kartika Pilar and I conducted a small pilot study among 45 individuals living with HIV or diabetes in San Jose. And most of the participants were recent migrants from Central America. And our goal here was to understand the health impacts of a community-led urban gardening and a nutrition intervention, which also has positive environmental benefits. 
And participants noted uh, improvements in nutrition, mental health, and health behaviors, as you can see from the quotes. And I'll just read you the top quote on nutrition. We're cooking new things, losing weight, feeling healthier. We got blood pressures down. My oldest was at risk for childhood diabetes. That's gone. Ocean farming, I think, is another great example of a regenerative intervention that improves health and livelihoods. So this is a form of aquaculture that uses a vertical approach to diversify what can be harvested from the ocean. And as you can see in the picture on the right, this can include extracting sea salt um, from the surface, cultivating kelp, seaweed, scallops, and mussels through suspended ropes and nets, and catching fish and growing oysters um, in cages on the seabed. And these ocean farms reduce both food insecurity and overfishing. <clears throat> They're also a low cost, zero input and easily scalable solution that provides a climate adaptive livelihood intervention, particularly for women. Seaweed also interestingly has many climate benefits since it could be added to livestock feed to reduce methane emissions and it sequesters carbon. So helping to mitigate ocean acidification. So going back to the DHHS recommendations, clean cook stoves provide a nice example of a climate-based adaptation and resilience intervention. So over 3 billion people cook on open fires or stoves that use wood um, or plants for fuel. And this contributes to 4 million premature deaths a year. And smoke and soot from these fires are responsible for 2 to 5% of annual greenhouse gas emissions. And these cooking practices we know also exacerbate gender inequality since it's usually women and girls that are doing the cooking and collecting the fuel. So projects such as Project Surya in India are working to replace traditional cook stoves with cleaner alternatives, such as stoves that are solar powered. And this has been found to reduce ozone producing gases and methanes and keeps people from cutting down trees. Studies in fact show that these um, stoves and these interventions can lead to a 40% reduction in black carbon and also improve respiratory health and decrease symptoms of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And I'll now turn to Ariane to talk about other types of solutions. So health professionals have always been on the front lines of advocating for solutions to the world's most pressing health concerns. And as Sherry said, the health science community has an absolutely vital role to play in tackling climate change. We need to ensure learners at all levels of the education continuum from students, residents, fellows, and faculty reflect on their role and responsibility in combating the health effects of the climate crisis. And as such, you know, education is a core solution to this crisis. The history of education has pointed to the fact that education plays a vital role in instigating societal change. For instance, higher education is linked to increased tolerance, prosperity, civic engagement, in addition, research has shown that education institutions play a critical role in leading transformative change and progress in society. So we really want health science institutions to provide an education that prepares our learners for what we call environmental accountability, accountability which is the idea that our institutions, education, research, and service activities develop, promote, and protect environmentally sustainable solutions to address the health concerns of the communities they serve. My research team and I have done early work to help identify how to increase climate health knowledge uptake by learners. In order for learners to comprehend the impact of global environmental changes on patient care, connecting these changes to the local community health is absolutely paramount. Through a worldwide study with climate health and climate justice experts, we found three facets were necessary to ensure education for climate and health is relevant to the local context. These three facets are really number one is community involvement. Students become familiar with real world, locally relevant issues by identifying opportunities for engagement with community members. For example, pulmonary function testing for individuals living near um, areas affected by wildfires. Curricular changes, number two, are curricular changes that involve the community, such as inviting community leaders and patients to educate learners. And number three is educational partnerships with local organizations and communities. So exemplar partnerships include such as those in Brazil in which learners uh, work with local farmers to provide fresher pesticide-free foods at the hospital, reducing um, food miles and carbon emissions. 
Faculty in the health profession schools with expertise in climate and health are needed to ensure this education can happen, but current landscape assessments that we've conducted show that expertise in climate and health is lacking among faculty. And so building on this, we designed and implemented the Climate and Health Faculty Development Initiative. Our goals were to educate, engage, support, and inspire health science faculty members to infuse and integrate climate and health into their ongoing teaching, transform their courses, and ultimately educate their learners. We used a train the trainer model to train 10 faculty leads and 96 faculty across six University of California health science campuses to integrate climate change and health into their existing courses. Overall, 99 courses were transformed and over 7,000 students were reached across all health sciences, including medicine, veterinary medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and dentistry. Educating the community is key. Um, and um, this, this, and making sure that they learn about climate health and equity seems paramount. Um, the UCSF um, OSHA Mini Medical School for the Public gives members of the community the opportunity to see and hear what goes on in everyday UCSF classrooms and research labs with lectures from UCSF, UCSF faculty, led by Catherine Gundling and Robin Cooper. Uh, seven topics were covered, which included health, the health emergency of our changing climate, and um, climate change in the era of COVID. Um, there have been some amazingly novel education efforts around the world. On the top left um, shows a few of these initiatives. For example, the Planetary Health Report Card founded by Carly Hampshire, one of our center fellows, is a student-driven metric-based initiative to inspire planetary health education engagement in medical schools and is now used globally. Uh, the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health works with health professional schools around the world to develop a core global knowledge set and model curricula to prepare health professionals to face climate and health impacts. The list on the bottom shows some novel training programs on climate and health with the number of these programs growing um, over time. For example, the University of Colorado School of Medicine inaugurated the nation's first graduate uh, medical education, so GME fellowship in climate and health science policy with the goal to train credible, knowledgeable health leaders in clinical basic science and policy settings. Um, the climate Health Organizing Fellows Program is a joint effort between the Cambridge Health Alliance and Harvard Medical School, develops a cadre of health professionals to advance climate solutions with a focus on learning about health equity, implications of climate change, and developing durable community organizing skills that help create structural change. Um, as a society, we do have to think about broader solutions and policies. As Sherry mentioned, health has to be at the table, and we must focus on the co-benefits to human health and the environment and all the solutions that we consider. One example of a co-benefit um, focused solution that has been the effort to retrofit ceilings in Cape Town, South Africa. Cape Town's climate can be moist and cold, making its residents susceptible to TB and other illnesses, especially in low-income neighborhoods where housing often lacks the proper insulation. The city realized that by focusing on retrofitting ceilings, they could improve the health of the community and the energy efficiency of the buildings, reducing the fuel used to heat homes by up to 74% in the winter. To date, the city has retrofitted almost 10,000 homes. It is estimated that the total impact of these retrofits will save approximately 7,000 tons of carbon dioxide each year. And the city's subsidy regulations for new low-income housing were changed to include properly insulated ceilings. Residents have subsequently reported significant improvements in health and financial burdens because upgrades led to significant reductions in energy and healthcare costs. Another solution focused on the co-benefits in the summer of 2019, temperatures in Paris soared to a record high of 109 degrees during the heat waves, which killed approximately 1,000 people across France. And in response, the city began mapping its network of what they called cool islands. These were 800 generally free sites like shaded parks, trees, fountains that served as a refuge for residents during extreme heat. The project resulted in the creation of the Extrema Paris app, which geolocates the user to suggest the coolest spots from their location. 
Um, and the, through the app, the city of Paris was able to inform residents about how and where to cool off while maintaining their health and economic productivity. Sherry and I, um, with support of an amazing team, received um, the University of California Office of the President and UCSF Chancellor's Office funding to launch the new center for UC, uh, the new UC Center for Climate, Health and Equity, um, which launched in July of 2021. Um, the center is housed at UCSF and has a mission to harness the expertise and leadership of the health sector to drive climate action for health and health action for the climate. Ultimately, our vision is to advance equitable and just climate solutions that promote human health and a healthy planet. These efforts will be channeled through the four pillars that you see here. In research, we aim to create a transdisciplinary research hub, establish a solutions-focused body of evidence on climate and health pathways, and encourage multidisciplinary and cross-UC campus collaborations. We're building an education hub on climate and health for health professionals and community stakeholders. And as a part of that, are hosting colloquia, providing mentoring and professional development opportunities. Our health systems pillar supports UC's efforts to be a national leader in sustainable and climate smart healthcare, as well as to transform patient care delivery to be sensitive to climate related illness and health inequities. And finally, we aim to make UC's climate work actionable by translating evidence and best practices into effective policy and patient care. And Sherry mentioned this um, earlier that advancing health equity is a cross cutting focus of all of our work and should be for all work on climate and health. Um, here are some of the examples of the events that we have led over the past several months. We have launched a cross UCC grant program and just awarded our first four grants. We hosted a policy education event on the heat health effects of oil and gas extraction within the context of California's recent policy decision to enhance setback distances from oil and gas infrastructure. We had an interprofessional education event between UCSF and Davis on climate change and health, and have been really active partners in global and health dialogues, uh, global climate and health dialogues, including at COP26. Uh, we have several exciting initiatives for the year ahead. In research, we are building a data repository where we'll be merging California and national health databases with climate data. And our seed grant program in the coming year will support community partnered action research projects targeting specific implementation or policy issues prioritized by a community partner. In education, we are um, developing and about to roll a new climate justice and health course. And we will be starting a climate and health education grant rounds open to everybody. We are supporting a team led by students focusing on what's called the Interviews Without Harm project. It's a project that seeks to reduce carbon emissions during the application process for medical school residency and fellowship programs. And we are starting a climate and health education ambassador program where we will support student and faculty teams to transform courses throughout all of our health professional schools. Um, in health systems, we are developing a clinical climate emergency response teams, which are partnerships between UC campuses and local public health departments to respond to both climate health threats and disasters. And we just launched a green radiology program that focuses on research education and clinical practice guidelines to incorporate energy use considerations into the carbon footprint for imaging. And finally, we're starting a fellowship that would support faculty members to lead decarbonization within their departments. Um, in policy, we are hosting uh, policy education events on relevant current policy debates like California's new proposed legislation on extreme heat. And we're also gonna be hosting a series of three regional workshops to identify regional priorities on climate change and health, bringing together UC researchers, public health agencies and community organizations. And so in summary, we wanna leave you with, um, you know, a reminder that climate change drives poor and inequitable health outcomes. We hope we have also demonstrated how the opportunities to design interventions that benefit both planet and human health are critical. Going forward, we know that health considerations should be at the forefront of climate solutions and that the healthcare sector has an incredibly crucial role to play here in leading the discussion. There is no greater threat to humanity as scientists and professionals trained to care for patients and protect public health. We should feel compelled to act in this space. 
thank you from both of us and we are happy to take questions here is our team um, that has really been with us along the way um thank you sherry and ariane uh, for that wonderful presentation I, I i can tell you that our center thinks also that global climate change is the number one global health challenge um, in this century and so we also have started many programs in this, including a postdoctoral fellowship, seed grants, um, and we're just about to announce a faculty development award uh, for climate and, and the impact on health. Um, and as many of the, I don't know if everybody in the audience knows, Stanford is starting a new school um, for sustainability, but we would like to put health into that new school in a major way. So there are several questions, um, and I look forward to collaborating with the both of you, because I think what you've done is fantastic. Um, so there are several questions. Um, the first question is from Hector Bonilla, um, and he wanted to know if there's any data on wars that impact climate change. Um, there is some data on um wars and how they impact climate change. And in fact, there's a beautiful piece by Climate Nexus for those of you who are not um, familiar with that group. It's a group that we highly recommend that you subscribe to um, that has focused on really the implications of the use of fossil fuels um, in with the current um, conflict between Russia and Ukraine and what that really means for the development of green energy. Um, I, I would definitely recommend um, checking with Climate Nexus uh, on their website for the latest updates on what that research and the progress on that front looks like. Thank you. And, and yeah, and just to add that the, the exact same forces that are driving climate change are some of the uh, triggers of, of wars. And so I think that the shared common cause. Certainly goes in both ways. Yeah. Um, Barb Siegel asks an interesting question. Brazil, India, and especially China have dramatically increased middle-class populations. This results in a, in, a in a desirable increase in quality of life and an undesirable increased contribution to climate change. Please discuss the extent to which climate pollution interventions have thus far offset the negative consequences of increases in standard of living. Presumably more air conditioning, more fuel, uh, fossil fuel. I, I think this is what he means in fossil fuel consumption. And I think this relates in part to some of what Ariane had talked about uh, related to the climate gap and why there is a sort of greater responsibility on uh, countries like the US and European countries in Canada to bear the brunt of the changes because um, the countries that <clears throat> have contributed the least, are most affected by climate change. Now, of course, countries like Brazil, India, and China um, are now uh, major contributors. And I think that, um, I think that uh, the um, pollution that is negatively impacting quality of life um, is certainly, there's certainly lots of movements within these countries to uh, improve standards of, um, uh, you know, to decrease pollution and uh, improve climate responsive solutions. But I know that there is a long way to go. And Ariane, do you have anything to add about that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's great, Sherry. You've, you've covered the fundamentals. I do think there's some interesting work that talks about how one child born in the US uses so many more resources, almost equivalent to 20 children born. Um, outside of the U.S. in a country in countries such as South America, and I think there is a lot of debate in the community about you know sort of the the pull between population growth and standards of living and resource use, and really what is most responsible or how those two interact with each other to be responsible for uh, the impact on the environment. I'm going to go quickly because we only have two minutes. Uh, Gil Chu asks, can you comment on the benefits and hidden costs, including use of rare minerals of electric cars? Are we talking about lithium batteries? Is my, yeah. is my, I yeah. Yes. I mean, I, yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know all the research on this. I, I do think that definitely lithium batteries are not good for the environment, um, but there is a push 
to move in that direction because of the impact that we're currently seeing on fossil fuels. Um, there are faculty, particularly at UC Santa Barbara, that are working on this topic um, and are moving this work forward. And we're happy to share what we can uh, from the resources we have from them. And uh, just of interest, I, I have invited Deli Ogunson from UC Irvine to be a visiting scholar for the next year to talk about e-waste and how to, how to manage e-waste um, in this world. And I'll end with uh, you and Kim, who asked if climate health literacy is a competency for GME, UME learners. Yeah. I mean, we, can both, we can both take that in Michelle, yeah, Ariana. I would love and I, to take that also. <laughs> Michelle, yeah, we are actually, uh, we literally had a meeting about a month ago discussing wanting to create a CME uh, accredited uh, climate medicine fellowship um, that, you know, would be, um, you know, uh, its own specialty. So there's a, a lot of movement to uh, in, increase climate and health education and to make it require course, require part of existing curricula. But I think there is not yet a sort of GME accredited or CME accredited uh, fellowship to my knowledge. And I don't know, Ariane, if you have anything you wanna add. Oh, that's great. I would say our role model right now is the UK. They have made it a core competency. And so we have a team to follow. I personally would like to see this put into medical boards as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to thank both of you for a little bit, one or two minutes over time, one minute. And uh, I, I hope to continue this conversation with UCSF and let's see if we can move this forward together. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, for thank you Michelle. Thank you all. And thank, thank you, you so Sherry much. and Ariane. Bye. Bye.